The naming convention for roguelike in roguelike games can be incredibly confusing to new players or even established players in the genre. If you spent time in communities to talk about roguelike or roguelike games, there's a good chance you've heard somebody say some variation of the phrase, that's not a roguelike. This whole problem arises because people don't agree on a single definitive definition of the term roguelike. So my goal in this video is not to give you that one definitive definition, it doesn't exist, but rather I want to dive into the weeds of the debate and talk about different definitions in terms that people actually use. We'll start with defining a couple of categories or groups of games, and then we'll use those categories to talk about how people actually use the term roguelike, how they define it in different ways, as well as why they use definitions and categories. The genre started with a game called Rogue, which released in 1980. Due to that game's initial popularity, other developers decided to make their own twists on it, leading to games like Moria and NetHack. All these classic games follow a similar set of rules. They're all turn-based, grid-based, dungeon car RPGs that had procedurally generated dungeons and permadeath. Because games like Moria and NetHack stuck true to the core elements of Rogue, they were eventually called roguelikes because they were like Rogue. Of course, there's still new games in this category coming out to this day, like Rift Lizard and Jupiter Hell. It's not only old games. It's hard to get these different categories names because the whole point of this video is that there is no consensus over these definitions. Because of that, I'll give each category or group of games both a number and a placeholder name that I'll use throughout this video. I'll talk later on about why I chose these specific placeholder names, so in light of that, I'll refer to this first category of games as classic roguelikes or traditional roguelikes for the time being. Up next is what I'll call one of the first two big divides in the categories of rogue-inspired games. A little over 10 years ago, we started to see the rise of games that took the roguelike elements in a new direction. This included the release of games like Spelunky in 2008, The Binding of Isaac in 2011, and Faster Than Light in 2012, and continues today with games like Have a Nice Death. While these games kept permadeath and procedural generation, they drastically changed other gameplay elements. Most notably, these games were not all turn-based, and they departed from classic roguelikes in other areas, leaving behind the D&D-inspired RPG mechanics in those original games. Instead, these new games draw elements from other genres, like platformers, tactical games, bullet hell games, and honestly, too many other genres to name. For the time being, we'll call the second category of games action roguelikes. Now we get to the third category of rogue-inspired games. These games are more directly inspired by the last category games, but again, stretch those boundaries and brought in new mechanics. Most notably, while still keeping true to the two core elements of procedural generation and permadeath, these games added some new form of cross-run power-ups or buffs. While unlocks existed in some games in that second category, for example, new character skins in Spelunky or new starting ships in FCL, these new games brought cross-run upgrades, power-ups, and buffs that were very explicit stat increases. For example, some of these games allow you to give yourself more health or increase your damage output. Games like Hades also innovated in storytelling, but the cross-run upgrades and that vertical progression is the main differentiating factor between the second category of games and this third category of games. And that's partly because the cross-run progression in the form of upgrades really strains that notion of permadeath and takes it in a new direction. Some other games in the third category include Road Legacy, Gunfire Reborn, and Undermine. I'll call this third category of games Rogue Lights with a T, but again, we'll come back to these names a little later on. Finally, we have this fourth category of games that I'm going to call Games with Rogue Light Elements, or alternatively, Game Journalism Roguelikes, because I feel like I always see random gaming websites calling these games Rogue Likes. These category four games typically have one of the two core Rogue Light Elements, either Permadef or Procedural Generation, but importantly, they do not have both elements. For example, Sifu has a loose form of permadeath and going on runs, but it has no randomness, no procedural generation. Inversely, Deep Rock Galactic is a game that has that procedural level design and that feeling of going on missions, but it does not really have permadeath in the same sense that roguelike or roguelite games do. Both of these games have some roguelite elements, and because of that, sometimes called roguelikes or roguelites by various people, but they don't really fit even that third category of games that I talked about. I'm not going to focus on these games in this video, but I think it's important to note that some people use these terms and labels incredibly broadly and include games that don't really fit even the loose definitions. So we have three relevant categories or groups of games in this niche, and I've given them some placeholder names so far, traditional roguelikes, action roguelikes, and roguelites. And these placeholder names and categories are, of course, one way you could define these games. There are people who group all these games that have procedural generation and permadeath as roguelites, unless they have that cross-run upgrades and vertical progression, in which case they are roguelites. Worded differently, these people call category one and two games roguelikes with a K and category three games roguelites with the T. 
my names for all the sides and camps in this debate are kind of bad and uncreative, so I apologize, but bear with me. I'm going to call this first camp or group of people splitters because they split up all these games into many distinct categories between traditional roguelikes, action roguelikes, and roguelites. I made a chart that I'll show on screen a couple of times in this video for some more clarity because this nitty gritty stuff can be a little confusing, especially because roguelike with a K and roguelite with a T sounds so, so similar. They're also a group of people that use what I'll call the broad roguelike definition. It basically throws all of these games under a single broad inclusive category of roguelike, regardless of the game structure and regardless of the amount or type of cross run progression. To people in this camp, if your game has the two core elements, permadeath and procedural generation, it's a roguelike and no other information is necessary or needed. It's painting all these games with one very broad roguelike brush. And people in this camp might not even ever say roguelite with a T because they don't really care. They're all roguelikes. Finally, we have this third camp of people that I'll call roguelike purists. And I say purists without any negative connotations that are sometimes associated with that word. These are people who only refer to traditional roguelikes as roguelikes, aka only category one games are roguelikes and every other game that I've talked about are roguelites with a T. And a subset of roguelike purists really don't like the term roguelite at all because I think these games that are not traditional roguelikes are too far away from rogue and they really should not be called rogue anything because they're just not similar enough. These are people that stay true to the original definition of roguelikes as turn-based, grid-based, RPG dungeon crawlers with permadeath and procedural generation. There are even been conventions to establish a rigid and narrow definition for roguelites in this purist lens, including the 2008 Berlin Interpretation, which lists eight high-value factors and several low-value factors to define a roguelike. Obviously, not all roguelike purists follow these guidelines rigidly and strictly, but the Berlin interpretation is a prime example of how roguelike purists tend to use more rigid, narrow, and strict definitions. So who is correct? Which definition of roguelike should we use? One major element missing from a lot of these debates is the why element. Basically, why should you use one definition of roguelike over other ones? A lot of people will tell you what their preferred definition is, but they often won't tell you or give you a reason why you should use that definition over other ones. In a lot of ways, this debate over the definition of roguelike reflects larger debates and how words in general get their meaning. To draw from linguistics, there are two main theories about where definitions come from. There's the prescriptive approach, which argues that words should get definitions based on some reasoning or argument. Basically, some person or governing body tells you definition for the word and everyone should follow that definition. On the other hand, there's a descriptive approach, which argues that words get their meaning based on how people actually use them. Basically, nobody can just give a word a definition, but that definition comes from how it's used out in the real world. Let's first apply the prescriptive approach to the roguelike debate. One question I often have with this whole debate is, does any of this really matter? In some ways, it doesn't. And to be honest, I don't really care what specific definition people use, what camp you fall into. But I do think there is some usefulness in splitting up the broader genre in order to differentiate between different types of games that have different gameplay experiences. And this is kind of a no-brainer and obvious point. The whole reason we have different game genres in the first place is so that when you hear a genre name, like RPG, FPS, etc., you know loosely what type of game you're getting. And with that in mind, the most reasonable application of the prescriptivist approach to the roguelike debate would be to say that one particular definition of roguelike is better than others because it is useful at distinguishing between types of games that are meaningfully different from each other. Using this lens, I think the purist camp has probably the strongest argument here. Unlike the second and third categories, traditional roguelikes are a more complete or primary genre. What I mean by that is the criteria for being a traditional roguelike are more clearly defined and spelled out. The Berlin interpretation that I talked about earlier on is a prime example of that. You have to fit these criteria to be a roguelike, and if you don't fit all these criteria, you're not a roguelike. Because of that, when you play a traditional roguelike, you can expect a lot of familiar gameplay elements between that turn-based nature, the RPG elements, etc. That's not to say that every game in that genre plays the same or there's no variety. You know, there obviously is variety in there. But compare that to the category two and three games. Action roguelikes and roguelites are what I call a secondary genre. Calling a game a roguelite, for example, tells you about certain elements of that game, namely permadeath and procedural generation. But it doesn't tell you about what the actual gameplay will look like. There are card game roguelites, top-down shooters, hack and slash games, FPS games, and really way too many gameplay styles for me to list them all out in one video. And I love this diversity. It's one of the reasons I play games in the genre so much. But it does make the label less specific. And it's almost secondary to other labels. 
For example, Gunfire Reborn is an FPS game that's also a roguelite. Slay the Spire is a card game that's also a roguelite. Hades is an isometric hack and slash game that again is also a roguelite. Contrast that to traditional roguelikes that don't really need a second label. It's kind of a label by itself. You know what you're getting. It has enough differentiating qualities that describe the actual gameplay itself. Basically, purists might say traditional roguelikes are a nice, neat category in comparison to everything else. So it makes sense to distinguish them with their own name. Additionally, this narrow definition of roguelike was also the original definition historically. So if you're a fan of tradition, there's a historical argument in favor of the purists as well. But I think there's also an argument to be made in favor of the splitter camp, which is the camp of people who like to draw the line between roguelikes and roguelites based on that presence of vertical progression or cross-run upgrades. I personally feel that the addition of cross-run upgrades can dramatically change the feel of the game, especially if there are a lot of cross-run upgrades. It can change whether you have to grind for upgrades or not. It can change whether it's possible to beat the game on the first run or not. And it can change whether some people will even play the game or not in the first place. Though all these factors depends on how that progression is implemented, what it actually looks like. So if you're somebody that doesn't care or doesn't play a lot of classic roguelikes, but you care a lot about whether there are cross-run upgrades, using that splitter definition of roguelikes versus roguelites is probably the most useful for you personally, because it makes an important distinction between games that is relevant to you. And with that in mind, in my personal experience, I think a lot of people make these distinctions between roguelikes and roguelites based on what they personally care about and what games they personally play. For example, a lot of roguelike purists that I've seen commenting on the internet only play those traditional classic roguelikes, so they care a lot more about distinguishing those games from other games. I saw this one Reddit commenter, for example, who basically replied to every comment in a given thread about roguelikes and said they need to be defined in this narrow, purist way because that person could physically only play classic roguelikes due to their vision loss and some other physical disability. And I can really sympathize with that. This is a person that wants to find a very specific type of game, and if they don't find that game, they can't game at all. And they can't reliably find that game using the term roguelike because roguelike is not used in that narrow sense that they would prefer. And I can imagine that would be incredibly frustrating to have to sift through so many games that you physically cannot play in order to find games that you can play and that you will enjoy. In the real world, though, people usually don't use words based on how one person defines them, which brings us to the second approach to definitions, the descriptive approach. This approach states that we should define words based on how people use them. Applying this to roguelikes, this is basically a question of what is the most popular definition of roguelike. And I found this to be a challenging question to accurately answer. One great way to find out how people define words is to ask them. And I've done that two different times on my channel with my YouTube audience using polls. I asked about a year and a half ago, and I got these results. And I asked a couple months ago, and I got these results. As you can see yourself, people that voted the first time mostly fell into that broad roguelike camp, using roguelike as an all-encompassing definition. And the second time, most people fell into the splitter camp, using vertical progression or cross-run upgrades as the main dividing point between roguelikes and roguelites. But there were still a lot of people that used that broad roguelike definition. So already we have some conflicting results. But there's also a deeper problem with this, which is the small sample size and the fact that my audience is a pretty biased sample. If you're a regular viewer of mine, a channel that largely reviews action roguelikes and roguelites, category two and three games, you're probably less likely to be a purist because they don't talk about those traditional roguelikes the purists often play. You're also probably more knowledgeable and passionate about the genre than the average person. So maybe you care more about distinguishing between roguelikes and roguelites in the first place in a way that a casual fan might not. So let's draw some data from other sources. I don't know of any large scale survey that has asked people how they define roguelikes, but if you do know of one, definitely let me know. I would love to see it. So because of that, we have to use some more indirect data instead. These data are generally qualitative, so they don't measure exactly how many people or percentages that use a certain definition. And unfortunately, most of these data tell us what we already know, which is that people don't agree on a singular definition. Let's take the example of Steam tags. If you're not familiar, Steam has tags for games that are usually used to indicate a genre or category of games, but they are user generated. Anyone can tag a game however they want, and a game receives a tag on the store once it crosses a critical mass of users who gave it that tag. This means that we can see to some degree how people define things based on how they choose to tag certain games. It's certainly a flawed data set, it's indirect, but it might at least be able to tell us something about how people use the words. If you look at pretty much any game and the broad genre, you'll likely see roguelike as one of the tags. From Rogue Legacy or Hades 
traditional roguelikes like Jupiter Hell or Tome. But you'll also find there are three other tags that are often given to these games. Traditional roguelike, action roguelike, and roguelite. Hey, what a strange coincidence. Those are three names that I use for three categories in this video. From looking through a lot of these games, I found these secondary tags to actually pretty closely match up to the three categories that I outlined at the start. For example, Tangle Deep and Rift Wizard have that traditional roguelike tag. Enter the Gungeon and The Binding of Isaac have the action roguelike tag. In more vertical progression heavy games like Rogue Legacy 2 or Gunfire Reborn have the roguelite tag. Again, they all have that simple roguelike tag, but they also have a second tag that tends to be more specific. Of course, it's impossible for me personally to know what's really going on in people's minds when they tag these games. But I'm going to draw two conclusions from these tags regardless. First, enough people call all of these games roguelikes, and that's why all of them have that tag. In other words, there are a significant number of people that use that broad roguelike definition. Second, enough people care about distinguishing between these types of games that secondary tags have shown up and allow for more specificity. You can also see this fact with an incredibly popular post in the roguelike subreddit, a subreddit that uses the stricter, more purest definition of roguelike, where they encourage everyone in the subreddit to use their traditional roguelike tag and make sure the games that are not traditional roguelikes aren't tagged as such. In other words, don't bother fighting over roguelike broadly, but make sure that our niche of games is correctly categorized under traditional roguelike. And I spent a while going through the different roguelike and roguelites, and like I said earlier, most of these games had secondary tags that more or less fit those three categories that I outlined earlier. Though of course, not every game fits so neatly. For example, Hades has both the action roguelike and roguelike tag on Steam, in addition to that broad roguelike tag. So if you're looking for a new game in one of the subgenres on Steam, I would recommend skipping the roguelike tag entirely and use one of those more specific tags to look up those games instead. If you only want to play traditional roguelikes, use the traditional roguelike tag. On the other hand, if you're in the broad roguelike definition camp, you like all these games and don't care about distinguishing them, use the Steam tag for roguelike and it will give you every game in this broad category and maybe some games that don't even fit that broad category. Before wrapping up, I want to touch briefly on a couple other groupings that didn't really fit my three category system that I outlined earlier on. The most important one that I want to talk about is the difference between category two and three games, or games that I called action roguelikes and roguelites. The key difference I gave between these two categories is cross run upgrades or vertical progression. Basically, when you die, do you unlock upgrades for future runs that make you more powerful in some ways? However, some people take this a step further and say that any meta progression makes the game a roguelite with a T, even if it's not an explicit upgrade or buff. For example, games where you unlock new characters or items would be classified as roguelites, even if there is no explicit buffs or increase in strength across runs. I think practically speaking, this sort of breakdown feels very similar to the purest one because almost every game in this genre that is not traditional roguelike has some form of meta progression or cross run unlocks even if those unlocks are very simple, like unlock new characters or having difficulty levels that you can climb. Interestingly, Steam released a video along with their recent Going Rogue sale, giving a definition of roguelike and roguelites, where the key distinguishing difference is that roguelites have that meta progression. But that being said, everyone might have their own idea of what qualifies as enough meta progression to warrant a roguelite label. Along these lines, in addition to debating over the categories themselves, you'll find people online debating over which games fall into which categories. For example, do games like Isaac or Enter the Gungeon have that vertical cross run progression? In some ways, no, of course they don't. You're not getting more powerful. There are no explicit buffs or stat increases. But on the other hand, yeah, they kind of do. You're unlocking better items for your item pool. And because of that, your item pool is on average getting better. And if your item pool on average is getting stronger, in some sense, you're getting more powerful run to run. But also might be some weird placements with the action roguelike label for games like Slay the Spire. It doesn't have strict vertical progression, so using the categories that I outlined earlier it would not be a roguelite, but calling it an action roguelike feels weird because it's turn-based. It's not action in that same sense. You can also debate whether the games like Darkest Dungeon should be considered roguelites, because they really stretch that definition of permadeath perhaps a little bit too far. The point of this is to say that even if you have clear definitions, clear categories that everyone agrees on, people disagree on where to place individual games, what categories each game falls into. It's the internet. You know, people are here to argue. That's just that's just how it is. And lastly, there's some other terms people use for games in this broad genre that I haven't really touched on. For example, people have used rogue like like games like rogue and rogue games describe the category as a whole or certain parts of it. I've also seen people try to create new names or repurpose old ones. For example, I saw someone arguing that these games should be called arcade games and not roguelike or roguelites. 
None of these terms really have any meaningful traction, but I thought that I would mention them here for completeness sake. If there's really one takeaway from this video, it's that no matter how you define roguelike, somebody out there will call you an idiot and say you don't know what you're talking about. In reality, there is no one definitive definition of roguelike. Some people will use a more narrow or strict definition, but realistically speaking, there's a larger people that use roguelike in a very broad sense. And if I stumble across a random person on the internet that uses the term roguelike, I will assume they're using that term in the very broad sense until proved otherwise. Speaking for myself, the way that I've used these terms has changed over time. As I mentioned earlier, I don't really care about the particular labels that are given, but I do think there is some utility and usefulness in having different names, different categories of games in order to distinguish them. When I made a video a year or two ago giving a definition for roguelike and roguelites, I focused solely on vertical progression or cross run upgrades as that important divisive differentiating factor between roguelike and roguelites. And as I mentioned earlier, that type of progression can have a big impact on gameplay and impact who enjoys the game and who wants to play it. But I've also come to really sympathize with the roguelike purists, because I do think traditional roguelikes should have their own distinct label in some form to help fans of those games be able to more easily find them. Because of that, I always refer to those types of games as traditional roguelikes or classic roguelikes. And I also always refer to games with vertical progression or cross run upgrades as roguelites with a T. For games that fall in the middle, I still don't really decide what I want to call them, how I want to refer to them, between roguelites or action roguelikes or something else. Practically speaking, I guess I often call this middle category of games roguelites with a T in order to avoid this whole roguelike debate that just made a 20 minute video on. But I do try to always specify whether a game has cross run upgrades or vertical progression. I think the presence of that is a very important differentiating factor that can really change how the game feels and who wants to play it. As I've already emphasized, I care more about the structure of the game being communicated than I care about certain label being given to that game. I will end with a couple of generalizable rules though. One, roguelikes and roguelites need both permadeath and procedural generation. If there's no permadeath, if there's no randomness, it's not a roguelite or a roguelike. Two, roguelite is always gonna be the broader category than roguelike, regardless of who you ask. Three, please don't spell it R-O-U-G-E, it's R-O-G-U-E. And finally, very niche pet peeve of mine, but Hollow Knight is not part of this genre. It has no permadeath, it has no randomness, there's no procedural generation. I don't know why, but I've gotten a number of comments telling me this game is missing on my tier list video or recommending it to me as a roguelite to play. I don't understand where that's coming from. It's not part of the genre, it doesn't really fit any of these definitions, it doesn't have either of the core elements. But anyways, I'm curious what you guys think though. Where do you fall in this debate? And does this debate even matter in the first place? And is there something major that I'm missing in this video that I haven't considered so far? It's been quite a long time since I made a video essay or analytical type video. I've never made one this long or in depth before. So let me know if you enjoyed it. I have a couple more planned, hopefully to be out this summer. And to be honest, I'll probably make those regardless of how well people respond to this video. And if you don't like this type of video, I'll have more normal reviews out soon. Huge thank you and shout out to all of our channel members who helped make videos like this one possible. Thank you for supporting the channel. Please like this video to help me out in the algorithm, and thanks for watching.